Good morning, family. This morning, we are going to continue with our journey around rest and restoration. As we look at the book of Mark, chapter 6, we're going to look at four verses, verses 30 through 34. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible, and it reads as follows. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away to, in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. And now many of them saw, many saw them going and recognized them and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. The grass withers and the flowers fade. The word of our Lord stands for putting our crowded thoughts to rest. Our way of prayer and centering to invite God into the space, to invite God to speak to us as we need it individually and collectively. Let's simply breathe in the breath of life that God gave us. Breathe deep and release. God, in this breath, we trust that you know what's best for us. So some of the scariest moments I've had behind the wheel on the road are moments that I have heard many others recall having had themselves. It's the moment when you arrive at a destination and you can't remember any or you remember very little of the drive. The moment you realize that you were in a dreamlike state with your mind occupied by another place and your thoughts fixed not on the road, but somewhere in an imaginary future or an untouchable past. Your body was in the car, your hands on the wheel, your feet on the gas pedal, but your mind, and more specifically, your conscious mind, was somewhere else entirely. I am literally shook every time it happens, and I vow to not do it again, <laughs> but I'm often unsuccessful at that. So I'm gonna invite us to use this text today as a way of engaging and responding to several, but one in particular, of the greatest hindrances to rest that many of us have. So uh, we're going to step through this passage and we're going to make a few stops along the way, but we eventually are going to end up at what I would see as one of the greatest hindrances to rest. It's not time, not desire, not opportunity, but the state of our minds. Rest is not just the location or state of your body and environment, but also the state and location of your mind, which impacts your emotions. Similar to the movements um, or to the moments that we have that we realized our bodies have been on autopilot while our minds ventured elsewhere, we can create a perfect atmosphere for rest. We can take time off, we can carve time out, go to a destination, spend days there and still come back exhausted because our minds never stopped the entire time. In our passage, the apostles here, meaning the disciples, do the right things, in my opinion, when they are tired and exhausted. And our first stop along the way is really early on. The first thing they do is they trust Jesus enough to be honest with him. They unload and share all that they had done and how busy they have been. And this is another hindrance to rest. Trust. It is, or resting is to trust God that if we are obedient in resting, that we will get done all we need to get done when rest is over. So I'm reading this book right now in which one of the characters has a unique ability in the school that he attends. But because he believes he is the only one who can stop the evil coming to harm others, 
He exhausts himself staying up around the clock to defend everybody. But in one of the battles that he has with a foe, he is so exhausted that he mistakes the nature of his foe's strength and his strategy to take the monster down actually helps the monster to thrive. His friend who comes searching for him, who is worried about him, notices that he's missed the mark, joins the fight and defeats the foe. Afterward, she demands that he stop to rest because not resting meant the very thing he believed his call to be was compromised. We need rest, which means God created us to have regular cycles of rest, so much so that God modeled it even though God didn't need it. To not rest is to say to God, we don't need something God says we do need. It is to compromise any call we have or work we must do. They come to Jesus and are honest about it all. And Jesus says what? Come away to a deserted place and rest a while. Because they had not even had time to stop and eat. A sure sign that we are doing more than what is healthy is not giving ourselves permission to stop and receive the basic necessities, y'all, of life. But more than just the literal reading here is the truth that venting and confession gives us some mental and emotional reprieve. The naming of how much they were doing led to the conversation and invitation to take a break. Sometimes we really do need the permission to exit left and eat. Jesus says, come away and listen. Or oh, Jesus says, come away and they listen. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now let's pause again here. Because a couple of other good things are happening here. One, they went away to rest together as a group. Now, we, there are certainly times when we really need to be alone. But here we see that rest can also come while in the midst of mutual relationships, more specifically friendships. Life is far more exhausting when it feels like you're the only one exhausted. Mutual friendships means having people who love you and who can also pour into you and not just you pouring into them. It means that having um, that you have people who understand, who get, um, who get it, even if not fully, but that it's an important part of, of who you are for them to sit, to be able to listen, to understand, to seek to hear you. But it is also an important part of us being held accountable. So if we are going to rest, we need to be accountable to friends, to people, to ensure that we're actually resting, particularly if we do not have a practice of resting. How often have you asked others specifically and explicitly to hold you accountable to rest? How often have we asked others to hold us accountable for anything explicitly? But really, how often has it been for the rest that we need? So it is no secret that I have a group of girlfriends that I purposely covenant with in a sacred way. I had similar circles um, wherever I lived, even when I was there in California with Reverend Rodney and several others, and we openly admit to pastoring each other. But of my closest friends, there are some things I know they will understand when I call, but I also know that they know me and love me enough to tell me about myself. There is a trust there that requires I be vulnerable with them, that requires the investment of time, that it requires that I spend time with them. I have allowed myself to be known by them. Good, bad, indifferent, right? And I'm willing, because I trust them, to be influenced by them. Are you making room for friendships to be nurtured and cultivated? 
Is the desire for healthy mutual relationships a steady part of your prayer life? There was a trust of friendship among these apostles and Jesus. They were honest. They leaned in with those who got it, who understood it, and they trusted Jesus enough to be influenced by his suggestion that they leave, eat, and rest. And then it says that they got in a boat to go to a deserted place, which means they had to take up the anchor or release the rope, tethering the boat to the side of the bank or shore. The boat had to move from one location to another. Now, many of you know Pastor Jocelyn, um, who uh, pastors The Way LA, who is also a licensed social worker. And she shared with me last year that she had to um, develop rituals of transition during the day because she was working from home in the middle of the pandemic. She's given me permission to share this example in case you're wondering. Her mind, as many of our minds do, needed a clear shift from workspace to home slash rest space even though the location would not change. This helped her end her workday and began her downtime more fluidly. Now, I see that as being um, akin to taking up the anchor of a boat or tethering, untethering a rope to move from one place to another. In some cases, physically, like when you go on vacation or a getaway, but more commonly, mentally in our minds, marking a transition from one mind state to another is very important. They transition and they travel across water to what they thought would be a deserted place, away from all the people and crowds. But look at what it says. All the towns, all the crowds traveled on foot and arrived there ahead of them. Y'all, how jacked up. They finally get time away. They prepare themselves to be alone and rest, but work beats them to the place of their rest. Their deserted place is now also crowded. And here we see it. Y'all, they have been working nonstop so much that the people that they served were accustomed to having access to them without boundary. They did not have the boundaries necessary to support them being able to take a break. And our minds are similar. We can have patterns and practices for better or worse that are normalized, modes and patterns of thinking that we automatically default to. And along with those thoughts come emotions and often the disruption of rest. This happens to me often in seasons of stress where I am worried or concerned about a specific situation working out and I will begin to see a disruption in my sleep, waking in the middle of the night, running it over and over needlessly. We can do all the right things and still not rest when we finally take the time to because we are thinking about what we didn't get done what we are afraid won't work out, how much time it will take to catch up. The crowd of our thoughts often beat us to our deserted place of rest. And how great it would be if we could just turn them off, shut them out, lay them aside. If we are not practiced in the disciplines that help us to do that in a healthy way, that probably just isn't going to happen. But perhaps this passage has a little more to offer us. Two quick things. First, the passage says that when Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Whoa. I was confounded by this, y'all, because I wanted Jesus to simply send them away, get angry, fuss. But compassion? And I realized how often I do get angry with myself for the loop of thoughts that I just can't seem to shake when I really need peace, when I need to not think about work or not worry about something working out or not beat myself up about my shortcomings. I get angry and frustrated because I know the process won't change anything, but rather will only serve to create more mental and emotional stress. But despite knowing that truth, I still can't make myself stop. So then how? 
How, Lord, do we get to a place of rest and actually rest even our thoughts? Well, perhaps it begins with compassion. Compassion is empathy or sympathy and a desire to alleviate suffering. The Dalai Lama says that compassion is the deep radicalism of our time. Jesus had compassion for them. What if rather than wishing or believing we can outthink our thoughts or further, the, or further outthink the many emotions that arise with our crowded and unwanted thoughts? What if we have compassion? Seek to understand with gentleness and curiosity why these thoughts and emotions are disrupting our resting time. We are talking now, you all, about self-compassion. What patterns of thoughts are you least likely to have compassion for? Sit with that question sometime this week. Have compassion for yourself. But then the idea of giving ourselves a break, of not being too hard on ourselves, is also scary. What if self-compassion then leads to procrastination, slothfulness, or making excuses to not do what I need to do? Or worse, to not take responsibility for our actions? How do we have self-compassion in the midst of these beliefs and fears? Well, we may be confusing healthy self-compassion with denial and excuses. Healthy self-compassion is an antidote for a false standard of perfection. Let me explain. When I was working on my doctorate, I had a professor tell me something that changed the landscape of my writing process. He said, Donna, you are trying to write your final draft first. No one is that good at writing. Give yourself permission to write a rough, not fully complete draft, and then rework it over time to get to the final project. Then he paused in his conversation and then he said to me, even after you rework it, it still won't be perfect. And once I was able, you all, to give myself permission to just write, the whole process was a lot less daunting, a lot less anxiety producing. In this case, the permission I gave myself to not write my final version first was self-compassion made manifest. Now, had I given up on writing altogether in the name of being, it being too hard or because I could never be perfect, that would be denial. That would be an excuse. Our passion, but our passage today, you all, doesn't just say Jesus had compassion. But he had compassion because the crowds were like sheep without a shepherd. What does it mean to realize that there are times when our thoughts are like sheep without a shepherd? What images and correlations come up for you with this analogy? What if our crowded thoughts need the direction, guidance, and loving care of a shepherd to make sure they move in a safe and healthy way? I've heard many elders in my community say that folk can't know what they know till they know it. If we've never realized the thing, then we haven't considered it and have therefore never had the opportunity to respond in a new way. Take some time this week and consider how the realization that your thoughts are like sheep without a shepherd serves to cultivate a natural compassion for yourself and your mental process. But now the question is, how do we shepherd our thoughts? Well, finally, the passage says, Jesus taught them many things. You all, realization is not enough. It's only part of the process. After we realize what is happening, we must then work to learn a new way and response. This is the step we usually give up on and walk away from. Change is hard, but it comes through practice and repetition. There isn't just one thing we must do to learn how to shepherd our thoughts. We must help create space for rest. We, um, we must uh, 
engage other people and allow people to walk with us and be accountable to people. And some of us actually have to have a little bit more help, right? We have to actually sit and spend time with a person or a professional over time that can help us do these things. So there isn't just one thing we must do to learn how to shepherd our thoughts and to help create space for rest, but many things. Jesus taught them, you all, many things. This is why compassion must come first. Without understanding and a desire to alleviate our own suffering, we will give up the hard work of change. It means changing over time the way we have often viewed things. It means being open to the fact that there is always more to learn. It means being willing to walk with others from whom you can learn from in community, also known as discipleship, just plugging that in. It means sometimes engaging to disengage and other times disengaging in order to engage. It may mean doing few things very well rather than many things kind of okay. It means trusting that even if your commitment to small, um, it, it means trusting that even if the only commitment you can make is to the small things, that that's okay because that's all you can give right now. And that small is better than nothing. It means working within our capacity. It means trusting that God is enough. That we can't do it all. So I'd like to invite you into a few things to help you get started pop-up practices of prayer and meditation. Take breaks throughout your day. I call these Sabbath moments on a regular basis to welcome God into your thoughts and allow them to pass. Even if briefly, to have a full moment um, with your creator. Okay, so it doesn't take a lot of time. Just these small incremental moments. So even if just for 30 seconds or even five seconds, several times a day, when we practice this at times, um, when we are not stressed, then it helps us to apply the practice when we are. It's like preparing to run a race. We don't wait till the moment of the race to run a long distance, but we build it up over time. Another start may be journaling or engaging in a support practice. By support, I mean leaning into trusted friendships or connecting with others in discipleship as opportunities arise here at the church. Or to invite others into your specific process and desire to direct thoughts, um, um, into your process and desire to direct thoughts in a healthy way. And as always, the basics are always necessary. A variety of regular spiritual practices, sleep, rest, a healthy or more moderate diet, exercise, Sabbath. These basics make mental, emotional, spiritual room by accessing our physical impact in these areas. It expands our mind capacity. It expands our emotional capacity. And therefore, it expands our spiritual capacity through accessing what our bodies need and how our bodies impact those areas. These are the things that begin to help us feel more confident and secure. Overall, when we are having a hard time quieting our thoughts that bring anxiety and tension, then we are trying to be in a place of rest. I believe Jesus invites us to have self-compassion by realizing that our crowded and lingering thoughts are like sheep without a shepherd. And that if we make the commitment, God will meet us in a process of learning new ways of guiding and responding to those thoughts so we can access what we all deserve. Rest. In the name of a God who invites us to rest, to life, and to abundance.